Hi, everybody, and welcome back to SOC 101, or everything you wanted to know about a computer but were afraid to ask. Today, we'll go over Lecture 7 about operating systems. So we'll start with an introduction to operating systems. Let's remember where we started this whole course. Well, we wanted to ask what we need in order to push a button and blink a lid. So we have some sort of a microcontroller over here, a Raspberry Pi in this case. We have a button over here, and we have a lid. So we talked about, you know, bare metal. So a bare metal super loop had something like this. We had some entry point to our program, a main. It did some sort of setup to tell us maybe where the uh, addresses for the lead were and for the button and so forth. And then we had a task. The first task was to read from the sensor, um, like the button or something like that, do a calculation, maybe decide what we want to do with the fact that somebody pressed the button, and then display something like go out to the lead and blink it. And then we would continue like this and continue doing that task over and over again. So that's this super loop, this while, you know, true type of a loop. And it's really easy to implement. It has very little overhead, and it's easy to debug. So it's really suitable for a handful of tasks. And that's what we kind of discussed uh, in, a, in a real high-level way up to now. But this can quickly get complicated. So we have this other microcontroller over here, and now it has its LED that we saw over there. But we also added some input device, maybe a keyboard or something like that. Maybe it has some other output device, some other LED. Maybe it has a screen so we can, you know, interface with it and see what we're doing. And maybe it's connected to Wi-Fi and has some sort of a storage. And so now we have something that's really, really complicated. And maybe we need something a bit more sophisticated, something like this. that will have an entry point, you know, a main, and then some sort of a setup for all of these devices. And then maybe we have these tasks that will have their own internal super loop, you know, that will keep on going back and forth to each other. But we have to have some sort of a scheduling and some sort of multitasking between them. So that's where the operating system comes in. We have in the operating system, you know, our level of these applications that we want to run. And they all connect to the operating system, or what we call the kernel. And the kernel is going to be in charge of doing several things. It's going to schedule the different applications onto the hardware. It's going to protect the different applications and the different users from each other. And it's going to enable us to interface with the between the different applications and the different hardware and so forth. So we can see the operating system as a referee that allows us to have resource allocation among users and applications, isolation of different users and applications from each other, and provides us as a means of communication between users and applications. We can also see it as an illusionist. So it allows each application to appear that it has the entire machine to itself. And we already discussed that actually, you know, in depth when we discussed virtual memory and so forth. It allows us to have an infinite number of processors, an infinite amount of memory, reliable storage, and reliable network transport. And it provides, a, 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 it is actually kind of a glue that provides us with all kinds of libraries, user interface widgets, and so forth that reduces the cost of developing software. So we can call a look at the OS with this nice quote, that the OS is everything you don't need to write in order to run your application. And we can see it as something like this. At the bottom level, you know, we have the hardware. That's the actual CPUs, the actual devices that we're going to have. And then at the top level, we're going to have our applications. I just gave some examples here, you know, Firefox, Photoshop, Acrobat, Java, different types of applications running at the top. And in the middle, we have the operating system. And it's going to provide some abstraction layer to talk to the hardware. It's going to provide some API to talk to the software, but it's going to provide all these different types of services inside, like file systems, memory managers, process managers, network support, device drivers, interrupt handlers, boot and in it, all kinds of these other things that we'll be discussing uh, some of them today. So what are the primary goals of an operating system? First of all, to simplify the program execution, to use the computer hardware efficiently, to improve the overall system reliability, to provide isolation, security, and protection, to make application system portable and versatile. And we can say it's for process management, which is time sharing, for system resource management, which would be multiplexing, for protection of resources or isolation, and for interface, which would be for simplicity. So that's what we're going to basically be discussing today at a really high level. You know, you can do courses upon courses and lots of uh, research into operating systems, but we're just going to get to know these things, first of all, as hardware engineers, and second of all, just, um, you know, a, a kind of crash course on what is an operating system and what's inside and what does it do. But before that, let's start with a little bit of history and discuss the evolution of operating systems. So it started kind of, or you can 
uh, take one of its uh, origins to a project called Multix, which was um, done between Bell Labs at AT AT&T, between General Electric and between MIT, where they were trying to um, uh, develop uh, an operating system for a computer called the GE645, which was a special computer for GE itself. Um, out of this project, Ken Thompson came out and he um, joined up with Dennis Ritchie and they built Unix, which um, stands for the Unmultiplexed Information and Computing Service. And it was an operating system that they built specifically for the PDP-7 and they built it in assembly. So they took this multi Multix project, which was built basically for General Electric, and they made it for kind of a computer that you could actually buy. Um, so... Unix continued its development, and it came uh, eventually into the Unix System 5 by AT&T, which came out in 1974, and um, that led basically to a bunch of different uh, companies that all used Unix to provide their operating system. So you had Silicon Graphics, which was a real big company making uh, computers back in the day, so they had the SGI IRIX. You have IBM, which is still one of the, the main players in this field, and they had the AIX uh, distribution of, of Unix, HP had the HPUX on their servers, and um, Sun, which was later purchased by Oracle, had the Solaris or Sun OS. So those were all developed kind of out of the System 5 of Unix. Um, So there's an interesting story here, and I'll be discussing it more later, but because AT&T had this contract with the U.S. uh, government of making telephony, they were not actually allowed to to sell software, so they weren't allowed to sell this Unix that they developed, and they had to um, uh, offer it as a a free license that others could use. So um, Berkeley took that and developed BSD or the Berkeley uh, Standard Distribution of Unix, and they really uh, released that in a complete open source type of way. It's one of the early open source projects. And um, Berkeley, uh, uh, on top of BSD, many different things were built. One of them was a project uh, or a, a company called Next that um, Steve Jobs started when he left or was fired from Apple um, early in the day. And they built some machines and, and an operating system called Next Step, which was built on top of BSD. It somehow evolved into what we could call Darwin OS, um, which was one of the early operating systems of uh, Apple. And uh, somehow this all turned into Mac OS or Mac. Mac OS X, um, then it was re- rebranded by as Mac uh, OS, OS X, then Mac OS, and also um, turned into iOS, which eventually came out for um, the portable uh, devices of Mac. So those all kind of came out of this line, starting from BSD. Then we have this kind of alternative where Richard Stallman in 1983 decided to break off from the whole Unix way, which I'll discuss again in a minute. But it it turned out that AT&T did start uh, selling Unix at some point in the early 80s. And um, Richard Stallman didn't like that. And he had this vision of a free world. And so he really started this uh, great open source kind of project called GNU. And uh, GNU stands for... um, for GNU is not Unix, and it has no basic code of Unix in it, but it's very Unix-like. And um, Linus Torvalds came in 1991, and he developed an op- a kernel that um, uh, that was kind of based on these same principles, and he joined up with the, the other libraries and so forth that GNU had to provide this GNU Linux kind of distribution that we is really one of our main stays in servers and so forth nowadays. And Android actually gave Unix a big uh, boost, or Linux a big boost, when in 2008, you know, Google came out with Android, which is uh, kind of uh, the basic operating system in in most mobile devices today, as we'll see in a moment. On a completely separate kind of line that has nothing to do with Unix, we had Microsoft. They came out with MS-DOS in 1981. And uh, MS-DOS was eventually turned into Windows, which was a kind of a graphical interface that was built on top of, uh, of MS-DOS. And Windows 1 through Windows 95 were basically based on MS-DOS, and they were for uh, single personal computers. Uh, at a parallel level, we had um, Digital Equipment Corporation, or DEC. They had this VAX or VMS type of a system, which was very popular during the late 70s and 80s um, for companies and so forth. But DEC uh, 
uh, had uh, kind of uh, winded down and uh, died off. And eventually, uh, Microsoft purchased some of the stuff there and developed what they called Windows NT Workstation or Windows NT, which was their kind of operating system for servers based on basically the same types of ideas as you had in Vax and VMS. And these things were combined together with uh, into Windows XP, which is now um, a kind of a more um, you know uh, complete operating system that can work both for personal computers and for servers. Um, so it was a combination of the the advantages of Windows ninety five, which was really popular, and Windows NT, which was a server level kind of a, of an operating system. So today, what are the main operating systems that, that we have around? And so Android is the leading operating system in the world with 42% of the devices that have operating systems are using Android, which again is Linux based in the end. Windows has a 28% share um, as of right now in 2023, and iOS has a 16% share of all operating systems. Mac OS X is a 10% uh, share, and Linux is only 2%. But remember, Linux is the basis for Android, and Linux is really what a lot of our servers and so forth are working on. So in the sheer numbers of the number of machines that are running it, it may be uh, relatively small, but these machines are the real important machines that are the backbone of the Internet and most of the services that we, we kind of use today. And this data is according to Google Bard. So I uh, went over to using this you know GPT type of stuff to get this out. So this was taken, um, this data was taken in July 2023. I don't know how accurate it is. A final note, um, I want to give some Unix-like terminology because you're going to hear this a lot in your uh, professional life. Um, we usually use Linux uh, for our different things that we're developing or other types of things that are running on Unix-based kind of systems. So you have to know what um, these different things that we're going to say um, relate to. So the first one is POSIX or the Portable OS Interface. And it's a standard that came out for Unix-like operating systems. So it's a basically... It, it's APIs that all compatible OSs understand that have things like CD, LS, Fork, Grep, Echo, um, you know, dollar home, dollar path, all these types of things are defined in POSIX. It also is how different types of things like threads and processes that we're going to be discussing in this lecture um, run based off of them. So this uh, definition is like uh, an architecture kind of to have different operating systems be relatively compatible with each other when, uh, when they uh, interpret different basic commands. So Unix, as I mentioned, it stopped being free in 1982. So basically, AT&T was this huge conglomerate that uh, had Bell Labs and, and other things inside it. And it was broken up as a monopoly in the late 70s and finally um, really broke up in 1982. And then um, that... Uh, that limitation that AT&T had on selling software was removed. And so Unix uh, essentially stopped being free. And Richard Stallman, who was at M MIT, he was working on a project called GNU, or GNU's Not Unix, which was an idea to take and um, uh, provide a complete replacement for everything you had on Unix without using one single line of code that is bo that belongs to AT&T. So the GNU project was to provide a whole operating system without any uh, anything that is proprietary to one company inside. And so there was a, actually a kernel inside there. Um, but really, GNU has kind of developed into a collection of free software such as GCC, glibc, GDB, Bash, and a lot, lot, lot of other things that um, uh, Unix, uh, Linux users use today. Um, Linus Torvalds was a student in Sweden who, in 1991, made the first commit of you know the Linux project. Uh, Linux stands for Linus. Uh, Unix. And it was uh, something that he just developed kind of in his garage and then uh, put it, uh, you know, on uh, open servers and so forth. And it turned into the uh, very popular kernel that is used uh, by uh, us uh, Linux people today. Um, so Linux is uh, not actually originally part of the GNU, pro the GNU project. And GNU had its own op uh, kernel, which uh, didn't find the popularity that Linux did. So what um, Linus did in the end, he combined uh, Linux with uh, GNU. So when you take the kernel of Linux and all the libraries and everything that uh, GNU provides, you get a fully functional and free OS that is uh, really the basic for a lot of the stuff we use. So GNU Linux are usually provided as what we call distros, which is a um, kind of a short way of saying distributions. And a distro, it, besides the, the, the Linux kernel and the 
the GNU, um, uh, you know, the GNU uh, libraries and so forth. It also includes what we call an X server, which provides kind of the windowing type of, uh, you know, uh, different terminals we have and so forth. The desktop, which is our um, real like uh, UI that we have, a package manager, which enables us to go and download different types of packages from the repository and other things. So that's all included in the distro. And there are many, many, many many types of distros out there. Some of the popular ones are Fedora or Red Hat, Debian, Suzy, um, Ubuntu, CentOS, Arch, etc. So these are different um, uh, distributions that provide us with a Linux kernel, the GNU libraries, and a different uh, set of other tools that are on top of them. And there are people who really love one or the other or use one or the other and different things that are compatible with one or the other. Red Hat, of course, is uh, very uh, famous for taking this completely free, you know, an open source Linux uh, GNU kind of uh, uh, combination and starting to sell it with the support and so forth. And uh, Red Hat has become really popular in, you know, the, the uh, commerce area. And it's so popular and worth so much that IBM purchased it a few years ago for $15 billion. So that really is how this open source type of world continues to make, you know, uh, revenue for companies. And it's worth developing not only as a, an idea to be free, but also as a way to um, sustain industry and so forth. So let's look at this kind of graphically. We have our hardware, our CPU, and our devices, and so forth. And on top of that, we put the kernel. So Linux is the kernel that we're going to be using uh, in our discussion. And usually in these types of operating system classes and so forth, we use Linux as the basis for it. So on top of the kernel, we have what we call the shell or the command line interface. And that's kind of a wrapper over or an API over the kernel that lets us punch in different types of commands. And the popular, the most popular one, of course, is Bash, which is part of GNU. But you also have KSH, TC shell, Z shell, and others. For example, in, in uh, often in hardware design, TC shell still lives on, even though it's really a kind of outdated and Bash has replaced it in, in most of the world. On top of that, we have the X server, which usually X is the X server. Um, there's also one called Wayland, and that kind of provides this terminal type of an interface. And on top of that, we have the desktop environment, which is this UI, this kind of Windows or Mac type UI that we put on top of it. And uh, GNOME and KDE are really the most popular ones, and XFCE is also pretty popular. Then when we talk about distros, we have different types of distros. So uh, kind of really the most popular ones are Debian, Fedora, Red Hat, OpenSUSE, Ubuntu, Arch, CentOS, Slackware. That's the oldest uh, existing distro that is around and Mint. So all of these types of things are different distros that provide this whole kind of stack that you can run on different hardware. And there are people who like one or the other for this reason or that. Um, each of these distros also comes with a package manager, and the package manager is just how we go and um, get different types of uh, software from repositories. And so you'll see when you follow all kinds of instructions on different places, uh, you know, write apt-get or write yum or, or different things. So these different ones, apt-get, yum, dnf, pacman, zipper, and emerge are package managers that are provided with these different distros inside of them.